first of all, two things are going to happen in this meeting. Is that I'm going to run over, and there's not going to be no time for questions. Okay? And that's just because the volume of data is so huge. But the good thing is, later on this afternoon, Riverside, am I correct? There's a containers boff. So the container, a lot of the stuff I'm going to be presenting today will be also talked about the containers boff, and we can dig deep, deeper into to it at that point. Um, so that's the time for questions. As I said, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to run out of time on this whole presentation, so I'll probably finish up the presentation. And a lot of this stuff is when I prepare to do a containers boff, um, I usually um, you know, figure out things. That's really what I did with this presentation. Secondly, I was very lazy. All right, I, I shouldn't say I was lazy. I forgot that I said I was going to do this back three, four months ago. thought I was doing a different talk, so I just threw this together in the last uh, few hours. So anyways, let's, let's kick it off. So years ago, when Podman first started, we used to do this. This, this was the presentation I used to give on uh, replacing Docker with Podman. At that time, we used to say, uh, you would do a DNF install of Podman, and then you would say alias Docker equals Podman, and then we'd end the thing with questions. <laughs> and, and the funny thing, I mean, that's basically what we've done. Right, we basically looked at the Podman, uh, the Docker CLI, and we, you know, we basically re-implemented it as Podman. I think we did a better design on it than Docker originally did, and a lot of that's because we had, um, um, yeah, we'll go that. People can take pictures of that. Uh, anyways, the, the the basic idea is that you know we sort of said we're going to be the same as Docker, and that was like five, six years ago. Okay, since then, if you look at the stats on GitHub. Um, for people doing pull requests, the amount of people that are contributing. Docker compared to Podman, Podman's about three to four times as active. Again, I was too lazy to get the stats for the last six months, but every time we've ever looked at this, we've been three to four times as active as that. And so there's been a ton of new features that have gone to Podman. There's a whole infrastructure that's built around Podman that is way more than just the Docker command. Okay, and Docker really stalled out. Now, what Docker did, Docker Rink did, is they re refocused on Docker Desktop. So they really wanted to focus on, you know, they figured out that they potentially could make money on that, and they went on that. Of course, we've replaced, we've also introduced Podman Desktop, which I think is a really good replacement for, um, uh, for, for Docker Desktop. But um, I'm only going to touch in a little bit about Podman Desktop because I really don't work at that level. I don't like GUIs. So, um, anyways. Uh, another, so that, that talk happened, let's say, around 2018 time frame. Um, this goes even further back. So when I first started working with um, Docker back in 2013, um, one of the big, first big controversies that came up was a battle between Docker and System D. And uh, so this is uh, Solomon Hikes, who is sort of the, he was the, the genius behind Docker when it first came out, and that's Leonard Pottering, uh, who is the genius behind SystemD. And they had a fundamental conflict going on, um, and I gave a presentation, this presentation explained how I was trying to be like the in-between person, trying to get Docker to get you know, a little fr more friendly to SystemD and get SystemD to be a little more friendly to Docker. Um, and so it was a really interesting situation, but when we did Podman, one of the really um, I wrote an article back in 2014, basically how to run systemd inside of a container. And it became the most popular, and I still get pinged on it every so often about running you know, systemd inside of a Docker container. But fundamentally, when we built Podman, we wanted to say Podman is going to totally integrate into systemd. Right? Systemd was the system. And so what, one of the real cool things that has happened, and I think the best thing that's happened to, uh, to Podman over the last few years, has been the introduction introduction of a thing called quadlets. So one of the things we did uh, and still exists inside of Podman is that Podman sy generates systemd, which allows you to basically figure out how to run Podman underneath a systemd unit file. So a lot of people want to, you know, if the machine boots up, I want to run a container or a service on the system, it comes in the form of a container, how do I do that? And so we, we basically allowed you to create a container and it's said Podman systemd generate, and we generated sort of the best idea of how you would run a, uh, a, a Podman command inside of a, a systemd unit file. Uh, the problem with that is that that became a snapshot in time, right? We locked in at that point in time the best knowledge we had in systemd had of running a container underneath systemd. 
But as System D evolves and Podman evolves, that changed. So a guy named Alex Larson, who's an engineer at Red Hat, who worked on, was working on the Ribos team, wanted to, he, he uh, worked with what's called a System D generator. And what a System D generator allows us to do is generate a System D unit file or System D service on the fly. So we can update Podman, we can update System D, and we can continue to evolve these unit files and not have them locked into whatever you generated at that point. So it's very similar to what that did. Um, but I don't, I don't have a picture of it, but you look up quadlets online and stuff. They, they look very much like a standard system to unit file, except that it has a container block in it. So uh, what the doc container, if you create a unit file with this, that's a doc, doc container, it's basically doing the podman run command underneath system to units. Uh, we didn't stop there, though. We also wanted to support pods. So fundamentally in podman, there's a support of pods, which is running one or more containers underneath the system to unit file. Uh, we didn't stop there, but you know, Podman fundamentally supports generation and use of Kubernetes. So another battle back in the uh, days when we were battling against Docker, Docker had came out with Docker and Compose. It's incredibly popular, um, and I'll show in a little slide that Podman fully supports Docker and Compose, but it, Docker and Compose has caused a barrier for people to get into Kubernetes. Right, and, and as Red Hat engineers, we want them to be able to run on top of, of OpenShift. So very early in the process, we actually uh, added a command, podman generate kube, and it would take your, your container that you have running and actually do generate a, a Kubernetes YAML file that you could you know, easily send off into, um, into things like you know, standard Kubernetes or OpenShift or you know, Kind or any of the other services. Um, so what, it, what this does, this uh, kube file is, as a quadlet, is successfully runs a Kubernetes workload as a service underneath system D. So we can basically, in, inside of a kube, uh, a unit file, you say kube equals, and you point to a YAML file, and system D now becomes the manager of the application running it. And the really nice thing about that is, I could fully test my Kubernetes YAML files in, inside of, you know, Kubernetes and OpenShift and run lots and lots of CI CD testing on it. But when I deploy to the edge, I don't have to have the Kubernetes infrastructure running and I can run the same application. So this, the applications can run the same way underneath Podman as they do under uh, Kubernetes. And not only that, but now they can run as system D is the manager of the, of the lifetime of that server. Uh, another uh, quadlet is a dot image. And a dot image is basically the Podman pull command. So um, well, we first added a, a dot image concept. It was basically, okay, I want to get a image onto the system. So system D, when this starts the service, if the image doesn't exist on the machine or the image has been updated, system D will automatically trigger an update to pull that image down. The interesting thing here is that we can take these images and through the power of system D, actually have a kube or a pod or a container rely on an image. So we can start to you know, link all these things together so that the services become uh, required. There's also a, a dot volume and a dot network. And so these basically are system D unit files that match up to sort of the standard podman commands for, for pulling stuff. But again, through the magic of system D, uh, we can actually link these things together and make you know, wanted by, requires, and all that stuff can, you know, all these fancy things that system D can do um, add on to this. One of the really nice things that Rivos is doing for the in-vehicle operating system is they are actually building all their applications as quadlets inside of the car. And uh, they can actually set up different real complex system D services such as, you know, myself, you know, the, the camera on the reverse it is in, underneath the target of, of uh, putting the car into reverse, then all of a sudden the camera comes on and different units go off, and all this stuff is happening underneath the, underneath the systems. It really becomes a really nice system that's system, you know, yeah, system D managed. So basically that's quadlets. Um, another thing that we can do with quadlets and containers in general um, is that we can basically allow a sysadmin to start to manage the services on the uh, services you know, on the edge, in your cloud, and everything else, um, basically allow you to update an application on a registry. So an admin will push an update to a registry of an image, and then 
we can have a quad a image file or other quadlets automatically watch the registry and see if the image is updated. So your, your app update application, say fix a CVE or whatever, you push it to a registry. Now you have all your workloads watching that registry. Something goes wrong at the registry. They will, I mean, a registry gets updated. All the applications will pull down the new image and all the quadlets will restart themselves on the new application. Okay, so you can get automatically updated through the system. At that point, your system will run a health check to make sure that the new applications are running in a healthy manner. If one of the applications is running in an unhealthy manner, we now have the ability to roll back to the previous container. So basically, we allow you to do automatic updates. So if you're updating thousands of machines and thousands of nodes, using automatic update for applications on those nodes becomes really, really critical. So there's really nice features inside of Podman to, to do health checks um, as well as automatic updates and automatically rollback. Uh, when Docker first came out, they had an OCI runtime. So when you run a container on a system, you are running a con what we call a container engine. That's Docker, Podman, Builder, Cryo, Container D. What those container engines do is they pull the images to the system, they configure them, get them all set to run, and then they create what's called an OCI runtime spec. It's basically a large JSON file that says all the commands, all the environmental variables, all the security stuff, and they define it as a big JSON, and then they exec an OCI runtime. So they exec a program. So Docker execs a program, Podman, Cryo, all of them exec a program to actually take that OCI runtime and apply it to the kernel. Basically, the, the OCI runtime usually is a small program that's only going to run to configure the kernel to run the application under the system. So that's one of the standards that OCI came up. The original tool that was donated by Docker to them was called RunC. RunC was written in Golang. Many years ago, a fellow engineer on the Podman team named Gi Giuseppe Scaran, over a Christmas break, decided to rewrite run C written in Go as C called C run. Okay, so that, that's a little history. I don't know, Matt, when was that? About five years ago? Something like that? Yeah, so we, we changed Podman's default change to C run because C run, run, Go is a very bad programming language to do fork and exec. Okay, it's not really designed to do fork and exec and run C had all these things uh, hooked into it to be able to do fork and exec. C is the <laughs> ultimate language to do fork and exec. So, so using C to do this gave us two benefits. One, it's incredibly performant to doing fork and exec, and two, Golang is, is huge, really, really fat, and C is really, really small. So uh, we eventually switched to C run, and I believe uh, Pete is in here, and Cryo is about to shift to, we're working on it, we're always working on it. So uh, Cryo is about to, and lots of lots of engines. You can, run, you can use CRUN underneath Docker. But CRUN, basically, remember I said that this huge JSON file that's out there gets put onto disk, and CRUN reads that JSON file, and also takes, uh, then translates into stuff to kernel. The funny thing is, uh, runs, so the standard is about reading that JSON file and translating it, but the funny thing is, is there's a bunch of command line options that run C implemented. And all OCI runtimes basically have to, they're not standardized, but in order to easily run underneath Docker, you have to, you know, you can swap out run C and C run. Docker executes C, uh, run C exec and has some options. And run, run C start has some options. So you have to follow that CLI to make it really easy to plug in. And so that plugin, C run, is implemented all the switches that match up to what run C does. But because it's C, it becomes easy to link other C programs to it. So, so what we've done, and uh, upstream communities done, is they've added new C run commands, a new C run OCI runtimes. Run, these are OCI runtimes based on C, C run, but they're not standard OCI runtimes because again, all the, an OCI runtime has to do is get that JSON file that the, the users and the, the engine is, is specified, and then implement in the kernel. But there's not really a definition of what it means to implement in the kernel. Um, so one of the interesting things that someone 
um, and our team and actually the community did, is they wanted to run WASM workloads underneath the OCI runtimes. So imagine you can just take it a WASM workload, put it out in an OCI registry and pull it onto the system and run it. Well, the traditional container way of doing that was to basically take the, OC, the, the WASM infrastructure, the tooling that is required for WASM, and you put it into the container image and put it out of the registry. Um, but the problem is there's not just one WASM, there's three, maybe four WASMs. There's lots and lots of different WASMs coming. And it really locks you into only being able to run one type of WASM. And really, from your point of view, you just want to run the WASM executable, not the entire WASM runtime as a container image. So what CRUN WASM does is it takes the WASM that's installed in your operating system and basically allows you to take advantage of it and only pulls down the, the actual WASM code. Um, it doesn't have to pull down the WASM. So C run WASM will link to WASM Edge, uh, WASM Mer. Uh, there's, there's, there's like four different WASMs available in, inside of Fedora. But basically, it'll allow you to run a containerized version of WASM. So WASM is supposed to be secure. Well, we're still sticking it into a container. So really nice workload. Docker does something similar. Um, but Docker set up this whole, you know, as Docker always does, they set up a daemon to run this thing. So this just runs the local WASM on your machine, the WASM engine on your machine, wrapping it, but it runs it inside of a container, so we still have SE Linux and other things installed in. A little bit older uh, C-Run project was C-Run K-Run, and does everybody know what K-Run, ever hear of K-Run? Okay, you, K-Run is a really cool, lightweight way of running a virtual basically launching a virtual machine. But what this does is that uh, C-Run K-Run runs a Podman container with KVM separation. So you might have heard of Kata containers. So Kata containers is sort of the famous way of doing this. Well, Kata ab abandoned OCI many years ago. And, and basically, they plugged themselves totally into Kubernetes. So if you wanted to run a container as a KVM separated environment on the system, that, that's what Kata did, but it only works for Kubernetes. It doesn't work for Docker or, or Podman. But C-Run K-Run does. And it's very, very lightweight and makes it really easy to run a container with KVM separation. So it's running a container inside of a VM, but there's no, you know, runs with a separate kernel um, and runs, but basically the only thing that runs inside of that VM is the kernel executing the program, the primary process in the container. There's a new one that we just introduced called C Run VM, which runs a VM as a Podman container. So what this does is it actually basically takes, uh, right now it runs only on Linux, it uses Q, Q, uh, basically a pull down a QCOW2 to your system and will run the QCOW2 uh, uh, under QMU on your system. Um, so, uh, but again, it will be running a VM as a container. Okay, so this, in this case, this could be a full VM. It could be a Windows VM, right? It could be any, any type of VM in the universe that runs it. Um, in the Kubernetes world, there's a thing called kubevert. Again, kubevert doesn't work with container runtimes. It's tied into Kubernetes. But C run VM is built by basically the same people, and they're looking at how they can take kubevert functionality and put it into it. So I advise you if you want to play with VMs, and if you want to run a VM at boot time in your system, and you just want to have it managed by system D, you can get back to that container, you can change the runtime to C run VM, and all of a sudden you can be running a VM under boot underneath system D and have that fully, fully managed via quadlets on your system. So pretty, pretty cool stuff. So could there possibly be other C runs uh, variants in the future that you might want to run on the system. Well, sadly, the one I've wanted the most and we've never been able to implement so far, but if any, any you know, really bright people out there want to invent it, I would love to have C run Windows. But this would be running, taking, taking some like wine and running a containerized, so Windows has containers and wouldn't it be neat to be able to run Windows as a container underneath a quadlet using wine. And so, so that's an idea I've had for many years. The biggest hindrance to this is file system support. So if I, the, the, uh, even, even though I've tried to encourage people to do it, my, my main job is to get other people to do work. I call it, I'm, I'm the Tom Sawyer painting the fence. 
So I'm always trying to get other people to do the work because yeah, I never have time. Uh, but anyway, anybody want to do that? I would love to see that. That would be, that would be the penultimate. Um, so uh, uh, this is really uh, something I've been pushing um, is the idea of confidential computing. Uh, confidential computing is, again, running containerized workloads under a KVM separated environment. Um, but what you want to do is you want to encrypt everything that goes on in the container, all the processes, all the data, and everything else. And with confidential computing, um, you're able to do everything as a container on the system in such a way that root on the system and the entire operating system on the system can't look at what's going on in the container. So that's why it's confidential. So even if you're an administrator and have full privilege on the system, you can't touch this container. And it involves root of trust and some, some complicated stuff. Um, uh, the reason I have this picture up here is a lot of people that are looking at confidential computing, are, uh, the, the big players are looking for confidential computing underneath containers are Microsoft, Amazon, Google, anybody running a cloud. Because the number one constraint on, on getting, you know, lots of companies right now do not want to have their private data go on to a cloud service and then potentially have an admin, a rogue admin on one of these cloud services be able to look at their precious data. Well, if you had confidential computing, maybe you'd be more likely to upload private data and, and, and onto these systems. My opinion, that doesn't help Red Hat make money. Matter of fact, that potentially hurts Red Hat because you know, one of the things, you know, Red Hat's really great in the data center and if cloud vendors can start convince these people to move those kind of workloads up, that's potentially hazardous. But the other end of confidential computing that I think is critical is edge deployments. So on edge deployments, right here we have a a drone that was shot down uh, in some place that probably the American government did not want that drone shot down. Uh, there are computers on this drone that could potentially be survive the crash and be hacked into by your adversary. So wouldn't that be a great case for confidential computing? If I, you know, the, 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 the assumption we always have from security is if I can touch the computer, I can hack into the computer. Well, in this case, confidential computing would do that. So confidential computing was announced by Sergio Lopez, the guy that did live K-Run, um, back in uh, 2022. So confidential computing is here. Everybody using confidential computing, anybody play with it? A couple of people in the back room have played with it. Matter of fact, one of the, Tyler back here is uh, at, at uh, the uh, containers boss this afternoon. I'll have him, have him talk more about it. Why haven't more people used confidential computing? Can you run confidential computing on your laptop? No. Can you run it on a Raspberry Pi? No. The only machines you can run it on right now are really, really expensive machines. Okay. I'm telling these guys all the time, tell me about confidential computing when I can run it on a cheap machine. Okay. So the problem right now is if it doesn't run on a $500 machine, I ain't going to end up on that drone. Right? If it's a multi-thousand, tens of thousands of dollar machine, it won't end up on that drone. But I'm not going to show the video right now. We'll show the video at, uh, about how confidential computing works. It's really cool. We'll show that at the boss later on. Uh, but uh, so confidential computing, I think I screwed up my slides here. I had some more on confidential computing, but we'll get back to that when we get there because I'm going to run out of time. So uh, uh, anybody that went to the... Uh, uh, Containers Guild yesterday, you saw a presentation, I think, Irvishi, did she leave? Okay, so this is going to be a presentation, I think, today on, on Build Farm, but I'll go over it real quick. Um, so the first thing I want you to know about is lots and lots of people want to build multi-arch architectures. How many people in here have dead fruit on the back of their laptops? Just one person in here uses a Mac. Okay. That's good. Everybody else uses Linux. Oh, he's got dead fruit on his laptop. Uh, so a few of them. Oh, now they're all they're, they're slowly you know, you know, uh, edged into them. My, my thing about dead fruit on a laptop is that Steve Jobs uh, basically hated open source. Absolutely hated open source and set up his entire company to thwart open source. That's why you'll never see dead fruit on my laptop. Uh, but anyways, I hold grudges. Uh, 
So because of Apple going to uh, ARM architecture, all of a sudden, I'm uh, down in 10 minutes. I get a lot more to talk about. Uh, <laughs> so uh, because the, he went to, uh, well, ARM, they basically switched to ARM. So we're all waiting for the ARM revolution, except that 99% of the internet runs on x86. I'm making the numbers up, but a lot of the, so if I'm on an ARM platform, I need to build x86 containers, right? So everybody running Podman desktop has to build, build x86. And building, those are called multi-arch uh, uh, images. So basically an image that can run on ARM and run on x86, there's actually two images and there's, the, there's a manifest list that joins them together. And, and actually building these things, it sucks. It is horrible. What you have to do um, is, well, basically what you need to do is you need to build on one arch, push it to a registry. You need to build on another arch, push to a registry. Then you've got to create a manifest list, which is a J fancy JSON file. And you've got to get the IDs from the, that you push to the registry, put one of those in and put some data in, then you got to get the other one that you push to the registry, put that in, and then you got to take that manifest and push it up to the registry. Okay, anybody here ever build a multi A Couple people have, right? It's really bad, right? It's very difficult to do. Not only that, but if you're on a Mac, you know, you're going to run the em emulation. Well, anybody who runs emulation or anything that's serious realizes that emulation really, really sucks, okay? Because, you know, just, you, you want to run, you want to do your builds on native native arch architectures. So we introduced the con podman farm uh, command uh, for building this. So farm, make, farm build makes building easy. And what podman had in it for many years, and actually anybody that uses it on a Mac or Windows sort of knows about this, is, is we have podman is able to communicate with a remote machine over SSH. So you can SSH to another machine. Those are called podman system connections. So if you're running on a Mac, the Podman you're running is actually Podman Remote, and then it SSHs into a Podman machine, so which is a machine running a VM on your machine. Well, Podman can actually connect to any, <laughs> any machine in the universe that has SSH on it that you can re reach via SSH. So you could set up two connections, say just two cloud instances, one cloud instance running ARM and one running x86, and have Podman uh, from the Mac or from any platform connect out to those and do that. And that's what Podman Farm does. So it requires access to different machines with a Podman service running on them. Using Podman connections, uh, runs builds on both arches. It pushes those from the remote machines to the registry, but gets back the information about what got pushed to the registry back to the client. It then creates a manifest locally, assembles a multi-arch ma manifest, and puts that manifest to the registry. So you can basically do a Podman farm build, and when it's done, you will have a multi-arch system sitting on it. Um, you could do this with, you know, if you wanted to expand this out to power, power PCs and any, any other type of machine. So basically with a, one command, it just looks like a normal Podman build, uh, we'll do it. And again, there's another talk later on this afternoon that's gonna cover that. Is that, is that I'm not taking questions, sorry. So 1.40 this afternoon. I can take statements, not questions. <laughs> OK. Uh, Podman build. So this is uh, Podman build now supports many build kit. So Docker created another tooling or some engineers that contributed to it that Docker build did not directly support. So they created this new thing called Docker it's a build kit. And, and it causes lots of confusion, because sometimes you, know, you do, some people do Docker build kit. Um, but Docker froze down sort of the, the, uh, the way that builds happened many years ago. This is probably 10 years ago. They, they didn't want to deal with build. And then someone started build kit and they started dealing. But anyways, it's kind of a mess. But when anybody comes to us with a build kit thing that we think is a really cool thing, we put it into Podman build. So we don't want to you know, have people think, are you doing a build kit build or are you doing build build? So we, we add those features to it. Um, uh, this is the slide I meant to do with confidential computing. Um, so the real cool thing about confidential computing is m making those confidential uh, applications, the, uh, the uh, encrypted images that you want to build, uh, is really easy inside of Podman and Builder. Um, and 
this is how we do that. And what, Pod, uh, what Podman builds and builds, Builda does is they can actually contact the, they, they can encrypt the image, then they can take the secret and send it out to your accreditation server. So this becomes, it will generate a secret. I got five minutes left. Um, they, you can push it out to your accreditation server and, and it eliminates you from really having to do much thinking other than identifying the accreditation server. So it's a pretty easy uh, way of doing complex computing. Um, finally, uh, Podman Build and Builder have grown support for uh, um, SBOMs. So the SBOMs is a way to, um, you know, uh, software bill of materials, what an SBOM stands for. But basically, a lot of companies now want to have a way to trace back where the software came from. So we wanted to make this as easy as possible so you can actually build SBOMs with the tooling here basically record all the information that could put into the image that you're building and the ability to send that up, upstream. So this is a feature that not many people know about, but it exists on that. Uh, we have a big push for ZSDD chunked or Z standard chunked. Um, the way Docker has done, uh, invented container images was they use gzip. Gzip in, that, in 2013 was sort of state of that way we would compress a tarball was gzip, well ZSDD came about and actually did a better job of compressing it, probably about 20% smaller images. Well, wouldn't it be nice to pull down smaller images? Again, Giuseppe Scrivano on our team figured out a way that you could take the, even the gzip file, the compressed file, and figure out which files are inside of that and basically adds an index into those files so that it can pick out, instead of pulling down the entire tarball, perhaps only pull down the files that have changed in that tarball. So these standard chunks has been around for basically since 2019. Uh, we're now pushing in Fedora 41 to use these standard chunks. And what it allows you, will allow you to do is if you have an update coming down to your system, you can only pull down the files that ch change and then Podman will recreate the image on the host from local content. So if you already pulled down a version of glibc in one of your other images, doesn't have to be in the inside of the tree of images that you're pulling down, you can use that. If you pull down another huge file uh, on the system, you already have it, and through checksum magic, and it can reassemble the images and basically eliminate you know, 70, 80, 90% of, of image pulls. So we want to get this as a standard way of future versions of Podman are gonna be using this tool. Um, lastly, uh, I'm not gonna have anywhere enough, enough time to do this, but uh, a big thing that we're working on is the idea of building your operating system as a container. So we want to, you know, we've, we've developed all these tooling, cloud native tooling over the last 10 years for container revolution and all the stuff in Kubernetes, but people are still sort of hacking together the way they uh, install lots and lots of operating systems. So if you're a sysadmin and you're managing 10 to 100 mach uh, machines, you really want to start to treat those machines as read-only or as image mode, as we call it. Um, and so there's, um, what you could do is build your OS as a container using, uh, I, I'd never say that adjective, uh, as a container file. Um, so I always try to uh, avoid the adjective D-O-C-K-E-R. Uh, but basically, um, you can start to build your operating system using container technology. So this, for Fedora Boot C, uh, Fedora Boot C is a container image, it's a base image that includes the Linux kernel inside of it. It includes system D and all the, all the functionality that you could use to put it on an operating system. And then you use standard container file workflow for adding content. You can add your packages, you can even add things like Ansible scripts and do some of that day two stuff that you usually do in an operating system when it's rolled out to the field. Um, you want to be able to take advantage of, of putting that into day zero, right? Why, why do we install an operating system and then come in and do a second day install, right? Changing the Etsy password file, things like that. Well, you can do that all in, at build time. And how would you build your operating system? You use Podman build to build it. How would you test it? you would run Podman run. So imagine running your operating system before it gets out to the field and testing everything in the operating system except the kernel. So this is running a container, system D boots up, runs all the stuff, but basically it's running it on your load, load kernel. You can plug it right into your CI CD system, so now I can test the operating system or eventually test updates to the operating system to make sure that my operating system fully runs, run thousands and thousands of tests before I ever deploy to my infrastructure. Um, 
not only that, but I can install my operating system. I can have my entire operating system taking advantage of OCI standards. So imagine having OCI standards that I can, I probably have one of these things inside of my private network that I can start to install my, I don't have to put my operating system out on some public website, but I don't have to build some other way of storing my operating system. I just use container tools for doing it. And usually I make people yell this out to me. I'm out of time, good. Uh, so wait a minute, well, everything I talked about at this point is, um, uh, is basically, I'm gonna ignore that for two more seconds. Um, so there's a new tool called Boot-C, available and there's a famous singer called Boot-C Collins out there, and I'm not talking about, he came from the 1960s, 70s and 80s, uh, I'm talking about Collins Boot-C. So this is Colin Walters, he invented a tool called Boot-C, which basically allows us to take these images and apply them to a piece of operating system, so we're actually converting them down to the operating system. I have lots more slides to go, so obviously uh, come to the containers box if you want to hear some more. And we can discuss at that point. So thank you for listening to me and 